Ladies and gentlemen, boy, do we have a special treat for you today. We have an ex-Yu-Gi-Oh! creator in Matt Bell joining us, and he is going to be reviewing some Yu-Gi-Oh! cards that he has never seen before. Matt, welcome to the channel. How are you doing? Hey, thanks for having me, Simo. I'm doing great today. Uh, really excited to jump into this, take a look at some more cards to see how much the game has changed. Uh, since I moved on, and yeah, it's going to be a whole bunch of fun today. Sure, you want to go ahead and give uh, everyone some background, just so people can get to know more about you? Yeah, no, of course. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar, uh, my name is Matthew Bell. I worked on the Yu-Gi-Oh! trading card game for about nine and a half years. Uh, during that time, I worked alongside R&D. I worked in product management. Uh, I worked with a little bit of the marketing team, the OP team, basically did a little bit of everything. But the primary areas of responsibility was um, going through card lists, reviewing them, uh, discussions with the FNL list. Uh, then there was figuring out products, configurations, where how to get everything into the stores and stuff like that. Basically a very, very long stint. You may have seen me on some of the World Championship streams a long time ago. I was also involved in the live streaming. Uh, so quite a bit of experience with the live events and the operations and stuff like that. Um, so that's like a very, very, very fast run through of what I was doing at uh, KDE while I was there. I do just want to say before we get into it, uh, thank you so much for devoting, you know, so much of your time into creating something that we all love and have essentially, you know, dedicated so much of our lives to because you're one of the people to help make that happen. And now you're actually moving on to a passion project of your own. Why don't you go ahead and talk about that a bit? Yeah, no, of course. Uh, just for the previous note, yeah, I just also want to say like a huge, huge thank you to the whole Konami team. It's like, it is a huge team effort. Everybody puts their heart and soul into it. So if you're ever at OYCS and you see uh, one of the Konami staff looking a little bit a little bit of out of energy, just uh, go up and offer them a chocolate bar or something and just say thank you. Uh, they'll really <laughs> appreciate that. But for myself, uh, I eventually, I've gone on to move into developing my own game. I opened Matorga Studios with the intent to launch our first card game, uh, Robot Raiders. Uh, so the idea of Robot Raiders is it's a one to four player dungeon crawling card game. So what that means is you have three players that are going to be taking on the roles of the, mon uh, the robots and one player taking on the roles of the monster. So you have a three versus one asymmetrical PvP game which is a little bit more unique than what people are used to. We'll go through uh, each of the elements of the game and I'll sort of give you an overview of like how, how it works. You have sure. traditional RPG classes. Uh, these are the robots and they're controlled by the free players. So they're, they have to work together in order to beat the monster player because the monster player's deck is much better than the robots. Their cards are much more powerful. So the idea is that you're essentially fighting uphill when you're playing as the robots against the player who's controlling the monster. And our three traditional RPG classes that we're starting with is we have the mage, uh, which is essentially going to be doing like lots of damage to multiple enemies, and it's very, very good for drawing lots of cards, which is something that's very popular with card game players. Uh, we have the... <laughs> I've heard. Yes, yeah, appar apparently drawing cards is good. Uh, we have the Rapid Fire Archery Scout. Uh, this is like one of our major damage classes, so this is the thing that's going to be doing a lot of the killing in the, in the dungeon, and you're going to be relying on that character to be pumping out lots of damage. It plays very combo heavy, so it's a little bit like getting all of those synergies together uh, to then kick off, and it looks really, really impressive. Um, then lastly, we have the Armored Holy Conduit, which is our tanky class character. So your job is to make sure that the other two characters do not die whilst you're fighting the boss. So you're going to be getting punched in the face repeatedly. Uh, you're going to be doing everything you can to just keep the fight rolling uh, so that your team has a chance to, to win. And you've got those three robots. They all have like different roles that they fill when they're playing uh, against the monster player. And you guys are going to have to like sort of talk and sort of plan like what you're going to do in order to succeed. If you're all trying to play a separate solo game, you're likely to get steamrolled by the monster. So teamwork is <laughs> imperative for this game. Uh, and to talk a little bit about the monster player, because that's something that's a little bit unique and is maybe a fantasy that some players like to live. Uh, you can think of it as a little bit like Challenge the Master um, from the Yu-Gi-Oh events. If you've ever gone to the conventions where you've got the masters that have like much more powerful decks, uh, this is kind of what the monster's doing. Uh, so we have, uh, for example, our first boss, which is uh, Doran the Spider Cultist. This one's like the starting intro boss, but a lot of the, you get an idea of the mechanics. Where This is a big spider raid that we have. So essentially you're storming in and you're fighting against Vindra, the Spider Titan, and all of the monsters that are gonna be coming from that. Uh, so you go through the bosses in sequence. So once the raiders beat the first boss, You'll do some looting, you'll do some leveling up, and then you'll bring the next boss in, and then you'll do that, and then you'll go on to the final big bad. That sounds fun. Playing as the monster, the boss sounds the most fun, just so you get all the overpowered stuff. But I will have all the info down in the description so you guys can check out Matt's game for yourself. But Matt, are you ready to look at some new Yu-Gi-Oh cards? Oh, always, always. Let's, uh, let's take a walk down memory lane and uh, okay. see what's going on. 
We're going to start with one that you might be familiar with because you mentioned it in one of another video uh, that you did with uh, Farfa and Josh, I believe. And I think this is a good one to start with. So let's go ahead and give this one a read. Oh, the Red Ice Dragoon. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember this thing. Uh, Dark Magician, Red Ice Black Dragon, or one Dragon Effect Monster. Cannot be destroyed by card effects. Neither player can target discard with card effects. During your main phase, destroy one monster your opponent controls. And if you do, inflict damage to your opponent equal to that monster's attack. Uh, you can use this uh, effect a number of times up to the number of normal monsters used as fusion, <laughs> fusion material for this card. Once per turn, when a card is, effect is activated, you can discard a card to gate the activation if you do destroy the card, and this card just gets stronger because you need more, who needs more attack points? Because why not, right? Because oh why not? God. So you, you've, you've got a couple objectives today. So your goal is, I want you to first evaluate this just from obviously a card designer perspective, you know, just ever, with your amazing background with Yu-Gi-Oh, I feel like you bring such a unique perspective to just discussing cards compared to some of our other guests. So I really want you uh, to just, I just really want to take advantage of that. And I think it'd be really cool to hear your insights on this and discuss, you know, just some of the fundamentals of like how we get a card like this, especially with like Red Eyes Dark Dragoon being the, you know, love child of Yugi and Joey's, you know, ace boss monsters, right? And we yeah. get this amalgamation in front of us. And also your goal is to think if this card was ever banned at any point in the TCG, that's what we're going to be rating you on today. So what are your thoughts on good old Dragoon? Oh, this card is good. <laughs> this card is very strong. It's just like Rig of Destruction on on a once per turn activation is already... And technically you can blow up two things, right? If you fuse it with Dark Magician and Red Eyes. Correct. Correct. Okay, so you're just double nuking stuff. They're taking the damage for it. Oh my god, that's just disgusting. And then it also has an Omni Negate. <laughs> Um, so if your opponent plays the game, they get punished and this card gets stronger and it's blowing up two cards. And Correct. if I remember correctly, the way that you played this is you played Red Eyes Fusion, which was a card made for the Red Eyes deck, right? So that you could then dump Dark that Position. Is activate Spell, summon something better than Clifford Towers. That that seems a little <laughs> bit nutty. So this really captures the fantasy of almost like Dark Paladin in a way mixed with Red Eyes. The destructive force yeah. of the Red Eyes and the Dark Paladin negation and sort of control over the game. So I think the card looks really cool, but this is this is massively overtuned. It's cannot be destroyed by card effects, so it's actually very difficult to get off the field. And it has negation as well, so you can hunt for those moments when your opponent's trying to breach uh, your protection and just go, I'm just going to negate that, and now we're at 4,000 attack. Yeah, this is this is an example of an, a really, really cool but overtuned card. Um, I'm going to guess this got forbidden eventually when people got sick of Red Eyes Fusion just playing this straight from the deck. Was it Anaconda Verde sure. that you could do it with? Yes, yes. That was the card that enabled you to send the Red Eyes Fusion to copy the effect. Correct. <laughs> so you didn't even need to draw the Red Eyes Fusion to summon this thing. Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> oh, who needs extra steps? Let's just get to the good stuff. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Now, I want to ask you this. So... Obviously, I, I know you didn't like design Dragoon specifically, but in from like a development perspective, what is was this like intentional that they took this obviously like iconic fusion of two of like the ace monsters in the game to make it over tuned like this to make it, you know, like a nice selling point for the tins because this was in the mega tins uh, initially when it was printed. Give us some insight for that. It would have been interesting because this card would have been released this wasn't uh, first released to the TCG, right? This appeared to the OCG before it made its way over? Correct. Interesting, because obviously this card is going to be very desirable based on it's ridiculously strong. It's going to have a massive impact in the OCG as soon as it gets seen. And then likely sure. would have been selected specifically for the tins to uh, make the tins much more uh, appealing for people who want to go out and get them. Uh, so it, this is probably, you call this like an asset, essentially, uh, or a sales driver. And you'd essentially be like, does is there, a, is there a good place that this fits if it's not going to go into a core product or a booster? Like, what does this actually do? And in this case, it looks like it carries the tins pretty hard because of how ridiculous <laughs> this card is. It did. It did. <laughs> uh, what a surprise. Um, Shocker. I know. <laughs> yeah. And it, it's, it's always kind of a bit weird because it feels sometimes a little bit dirty to talk about the business aspects of, of Yu-Gi-Oh, which is a very big thing. And one of the reasons that the game is such a success for so long is the way that sure. it's been it's been managed. Um, sometimes I can sound a little bit scummy in, in ways, but um, I'll do my best to be as honest as I'm allowed to be in, in the situation. Of course. Like crossing. Of course. Uh, lines there, but I could definitely see this hard carrying the tins and probably dominating an entire format. Like, I think this basically sets the rule for the format. It's like, can you out Dragoon? If not, put your deck back in the binder. It's not going to work. I would say that's a pretty uh, on point assessment. So you think that this was banned? That's your final answer. I'd be surprised if it wasn't. 
Like, because you'd have to power creep this or make the removal so much better to get rid of it. So I'd say this probably got forbidden. Well, get ready to be surprised because Dragoon in the TCG was never banned. What's interesting really? about Dragoon is that the decks that played it, uh, I mean, obviously they were going to, for the most part, filter their way through Verte Anaconda, and then you just get a Red Eyes Dark Dragoon in addition to everything else that you did, because Red Eyes Fusion, I believe, has the restriction on it that you can't normal or special summon the turn you activate it at all. It's not even like for the rest of the turn. Ah, okay. But because of Verte Anaconda's interaction with Red Eyes Fusion, it copies the effect, and so it didn't care about the stipulation. So I believe you could just do this as part of any end board that you're doing, and it's like, oh, cool, Dragoon for free. That's a lot of fun. Um... It's interesting, though, because there were plenty of ways to deal with Dragoon. I, I'm not saying that Dragoon wasn't a huge part of when it was, you know, in its prime. Uh, this is obviously before uh, Verte Anaconda actually was the card to get banned because it not only enabled Dragoon, but enabled a whole other host of nonsense as well. There were plenty of options to be able to handle Dragoon. There was the Kaijus or the Kaiju adjacent cards that took care of it. Uh, super polymerization was quite popular. Uh, there was just enough tools, and especially with the other decks that were good at the time, there was enough that, yes, Dragoon was... It, it definitely loomed over the format for certain, but it wasn't, uh, I guess, bad enough to get banned. And I think you could also make an argument from, like, the business side of things as well that it's like, we don't want to ban Dragoon. It's a cool card, right? It's just like, especially because it has of its, you know, role in, you know, terms of, like, historically with the anime and everything. That's why it took Firewall Dragon so long to get banned. I imagine that was, like, a hard uh, pill for Konami to swallow there. But... Yeah, uh, never got... It's banned in the OCG, though. It's banned in the OCG, but TCG, it never got hit. They decided to take care of Anaconda instead. Yeah, I can see that. It's just, just taking it away from any deck being able to splash this, essentially, as a boss monster would probably control it. Uh, and then it's like, if Red Eyes Fusion isn't that easy to get hold of in the game, if there's not a way to search for it, and then you also have the situation of the heavy restrictions on it, it's less oppressive than what you could be doing playing other stuff. So I can understand that. This card this card is still nuts though. I really like this. It's nuts. It's crazy. And I love it though. It's it's I'm glad like you you meant you made like the Dark Paladin analogy. This is what Dark Paladin always should have been in my eyes. But Dark Paladin's still iconic enough in its own right. Okay. So let's go ahead and move on. You are zero for one. Let's see what you think of this card. Time at tearing more uh, Morganite. Let's see. For the rest of the duel, apply the following effects. You cannot activate monster effects in the hand. Draw two cards instead of one for your normal draw. Okay, that's good, but it doesn't do anything immediately. You can conduct two normal summons or sets per turn. <laughs> you can banish this card from your graveyard, and then discard one time tearing another copy of this card. Your opponent cannot activate monster effects when they summon. This seems really cool, actually. Does it? Yeah. Apply I supply all the effects. It's not choose one. It's just, a, sorry, I misread that. I was like, choose one of these to apply. And I was like, okay, that's <laughs> Oh so no, much it's all of them. It's all of them. <laughs> so basically you turn off- Does that change your perspective on this? <laughs> yeah, it does a lot actually. Um, yeah, it turns off your hand traps effectively, but then you're double drawing and then you're getting the two normal summons or sets. That's so strong. Your opponent cannot activate monster effects when you normal summon this turn. Okay, you can banish this card. That last effect seems a little bit niche for some interaction. I guess it depends on the format. This is a really cool card. Um, I think that first- I think so. That first stipulation is for the rest of the duel. So if your opponent went first, you could go ahead and hand trap them and stuff and then play this. But mm -hmm. it feels like that drawback is massive in, in the current game where you need the interaction. Well, I guess if you're playing infinite impermanence, you can still play cards like that. This is super cool. It's like, um, what's that card that Raphael plays where you discard your hand and then you draw two cards per turn? Guarded treasure. Guarded treasure. This is like a better version of Guarded Treasure. It's like, yeah. this is the card <laughs> Raphael should have put in his deck instead of that <laughs> terrible card. But I love this. This is... I, I imagine there was quite a few combos and some great YouTube videos of people messing around with this. This is really cool. Imagine if they printed this like pre-2012 <laughs> compared to now. God, that would have been that would have been pretty good. I mean, the game back, what was going on in 2012? Was that just after Wind Up in... No, that was Wind Up in Zector format, wasn't it? That was Wind Up in Zector, yeah. <laughs> so imagine this in old Yu-Gi-Oh. Oh, this would be game-breaking in old Yu-Gi-Oh. I'll, I'll normal summon my two toy magicians and then activate uh, Wind Up Shark. <laughs> <laughs> and we're off to the races. Oh, great, the flashbacks, the flashbacks, no. How many shock masses would you like, sir? Oh, I'll take as many as I can have. <laughs> oh, I, I, lo I love this card. I think this is great. I'm not sure if this will see a lot of play, because like, sadly, drawing two cards during your... It's not a field spell, so they can't take that away from you once you've resolved it. Yep, once it resolves, it's it's permanent. How often are games dragging on multiple turns uh, these days? Is it pretty much... I make a board, if you can't break it, I kill you. I make a board, you break it and kill me. Is that the kind of where the game is at at the moment? Or does the game kind of drag on for a little bit? Uh, I'd say probably the former. 
Probably the former. Uh, okay, so you're not really going to get as much value out of this. It basically becomes double summon with a drawback if you're not getting multiple draws out of it. It's a cool card, but it might actually be too slow, which sounds really sad to say when drawing two cards per turn should be incredible, um, but it might just not be fast enough. So, yeah, how, how did this card actually get played? Well, do you think it was banned? Oh, do I think it was banned? I can't see this. I don't think this is... Hmm, I say that, but... <laughs> <laughs> You're like old Yu-Gi-Oh brain. You have like the you have like the little voice in the back of your head, right? <laughs> yeah, it's it's like kind of like would this this card would have just like been the defining for, uh, card for the game. Uh, who would have drawn this and resolved it first would have been. I think this is just really cool and it doesn't do enough initially. Um, you need to okay. you need to drag the game out. So my guess is not forbidden. Final answer. Final answer. Man, when Time Tearing Morganite was first announced, everyone was losing their minds because just tell Yu-Gi-Oh players you can draw two cards every turn and that's all it takes. Pot of Greed every turn. It's crazy. It's busted. And then on top of it, you get to get an extra normal summon per turn. Oh, this, this is Gem Knight, Seraphonite all over again and Brilliant <laughs> Fusions banned and all that. But this card was never banned. And for all the reasons you mentioned, Time Tearing Morganite, incredible card. I think, again, as older Yu-Gi-Oh players, we look at this card and we want to think this is the craziest card we've ever read. Unfortunately, just not good enough. The games are too fast. Uh, this is a card that effectively, when you play it, aside from giving you an extra normal summon, doesn't actually do anything. You really have to have the game prolong several turns to really see the benefit of this card, especially because, you know, the drawing two cards every draw phase uh, as mm. such. And so... There, this card does have a home. Uh, unfortunately, its home is in stun decks or decks that are super heavy control mm -hmm. that can prolong the game long enough that it's going to out-resource the opponent. So like anything that might play like barrier statues or anything right. like that loves Morganite because it gives them more cards to stop the opponent from playing the game, which is unfortunate, but at least it still sort of has a home in modern Yu-Gi-Oh! But really cool card. Uh, the artwork is sick too. I think this just design-wise, this was a, a fantastic addition to the game. I, I, I agree with this. This is a really cool card. In fact, um, somebody was telling me uh, the the Edison format is sort of like where you get like a lot of the older f uh, cards. Well, that's the format for Edison, but Time Wizard formats. If you could just take this card and Time Wizard it back into a format, I wonder It'd which broken. one... It'd be broken. Which one would it be the most broken <laughs> in? That's the question. All of them. All of them, probably. <laughs> there you go. Imagine, imagine that. You've got a card that just isn't good enough now that it would have been in any other format would have broken the game. God, because in like older formats, you'd have like tribute summonings. So you could like double tribute monarchs. I'm getting ahead of myself. I don't want. I don't want to think about how crazy Morganite would be in older formats. Anyway, yeah. so you're one for one. You're one for one. Let's move on to a trap card. Uh, Domatica punishment. Target one face of monster your opponent controls. Send one monster with an equal or higher attack from your extra deck to the graveyard. And if you do, destroy that monster till the end of your next turn. After this card resolves, you cannot special summon monsters from the extra deck. There is a fusion monster that uh, does something when it's sent to the graveyard. It destroys a monster. That it's is correct. One of the outer entities, right? I think it was. Elder Entity Intis is what you're thinking. Yeah. Yep. Is this, this is the, that's the card you probably send with this, I guess, to could be. two for one. Okay. Could two, be. Oh, oh, could be. We're going to play a little murder mystery here. Um, <laughs> Can't give you all the answers, Matt. No, no, of course. Answers. This seems pretty good. Uh, it's in an archetype that doesn't want to special summon from the extra deck, which does open a couple of interesting things. Sadly, no Seal of Orikakos. That card is past its prime. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> this is a great trap. And because it's got a theme tag, Dogmatica, I'm going to guess this is searchable as well in some cases. So this is probably really good for your setup, your turn one setup, but... It's kind of weird. If you're not special summoning from the extra deck, what is your turn one board looking like in this deck? One can only imagine this feels like a great card. Oh, you can you can trigger any wet extra deck monster when it's sent to the graveyard's effect. Although I don't know how many... Very perceptive. Yeah, I don't know how many monsters you're going to be killing with uh, Herald of... The the Herald that goes in the extra... The Synchro Herald? Oh, Herald of Arclight. <laughs> yeah, just send, <laughs> yeah. send my Herald of Arclight to the Might graveyard. a little bit too weak. Kill your Karibo and search my deck for a ritual card. That feels pretty good. <laughs> Uh, now, if I could just get all my opponents to play Karibo, we'd be off to the races. But um, and you're set. And you're set. This card, this card feels like a great trap card as well, and it's also not a specific window when you can use it. Really like that. The drawback is pretty strong, but if you're using it during your opponent's turn, you don't really care. Maybe that's the trick with it. It's just a case of you just use it during your opponent's turn, and you're never playing it during yours. How do you feel about the evolution of trap cards in Yu-Gi-Oh? Because obviously, you know, when you when you were, you know, at uh, working for Konami and, you know, also playing the game when you were younger as well, trap cards just felt a lot different compared to modern Yu-Gi-Oh. Yeah, uh, for anybody who is young enough to actually still enjoy life and not pay taxes, 
There was a time when the entire <laughs> game of Yu-Gi-Oh was like decided by I tribute two monsters to summon a blue eyes white dragon. Cool, activate trap hole. And that was when Yu-Gi-Oh started. Uh, that was like yep. a game breaking. You probably just lost a game because you put your guy into a trap hole. Uh, and a lot of the trap original traps were very specific timings. You're looking at things like Mirror Force. You'd lose the game if you didn't play around that. Torrental Tribute, you'd lose the game when you didn't play around it. Um, and all those cards like had fixed like windows of when they were to catch your opponent out. So you had a way of playing around them. Like you had to have sort of like knowledge of like my opponent hasn't used this yet, and this trap is still very live in the game. Uh, and then we got to we had like Jinzo was such a big part of the game. We got to a point where people wouldn't put more than five trap cards in their deck at all yep. because yep. like tribute summon Jinzo. Okay, cool. And then the back row removal was so strong with Harpy's Feather Duster, triple Mystical Space Typhoon, Heavy Storm. Um, and this is before we even get to the future where you sort of had Mobius the Monarch, uh, the Frost Monarch, which would then just keep clearing your back row. Traps really took a back, per back burner. And then we kind of moved more into trap cards that were uh, floodgates, I think the com uh, community calls them, where it stops your opponent from playing. We had things like early on, like skill drain and stuff, but we started moving more mm -hmm. heavily into trap decks stop your opponent from playing Yu-Gi-Oh! And that ends up being really not fun. You have things like Royal Decree, which just says neither player can play one quarter of all the cards that are relevant. Yeah, this is back in the days when Fusion was... The extra deck was a Fusion deck, and you're probably not taking that too seriously. If I remember... <laughs> maybe Twin-Headed Thunder Dragon, if you're being spicy. Um, and traps have gotten a <laughs> lot stronger, because I did see uh, the Dharma Cannon. Yeah, that flips everything face down. Yeah, the uh, Book of Moon on steroids. And they've... Yeah, basically... <laughs> Trap cards have really ramped up, and we've now got to a stage where things like Infinite Impermanence is kind of taken part of a hand trap uh, to be an actual trap card again that's relevant. And I think that was kind of a highlight of like when traps could be really, really good and felt really fun to to play with once. Because we got too fast for trap cards, and it's like if you went second, they're essentially all blanks because your opponent set up a bunch of negates. Unless you're setting yeah. all of those in passing, and then your opponent's going to be able to play, uh, just negate a bunch of your stuff while you're trying to use it anyway. Traps just ended up just not being fun. So they've been power crept significantly at this point mm -hmm. just to make them appealing. Um, there seems like there's a couple of really cool ones that have come out uh, recently, uh, including that card that lets you just copy any trap card, which I still think is insane. No matter what Joshua Smith says. <laughs> Transaction that, rollback, yeah, yeah. I still think that yeah. card's insane, but uh, everyone <laughs> disagrees. So I find, I find it really interesting. I, I like where the direction of some of the traps have, have gone um, in terms of flavor and stuff. And some of them I do think of are a little bit too pushed. But if the game's too fast, the game's too fast. That's the unfortunate side effect. Yeah, it's interesting because like you mentioned Infinite Impermanence. Another good one's like evenly matched, yeah. right? It's like they're trap cards, but since you can activate them from the hand, it bypasses the need to set them face down. So it's like, are these really trap cards aside from the fact that they're purple cards at the end of the day? Uh, that, that's, you know, that's, I guess, something that's more of like an existential debate when it comes to Yu-Gi-Oh! conceptually, like at its yeah. core. But uh, Dogmatic Punishment, I think, is just really cool. And I think a lot of trap cards have just sort of fallen into the category now that they need to provide like such high value and utility for people to even really consider playing them at all. Yeah, you're essentially giving up one of your cards to break for your opponent's board in order to play that trap card. If you're going second, it yeah. does, does nothing. Uh, right. So I can totally understand that trap cards are largely being relegated to the side deck when you can control when you're going first um, right. and just not seeing much play otherwise. Unless there's something like Infinite Impermanence, which is a quick play spell. Basically a hand trap. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So what do you think about Punishment, though? Banned? Not banned? Good card? Bad card? On its own, I don't believe this card could be forbidden uh, just because its effect okay. is pretty to it. But I guess the key thing is what card you could send from the extra deck, the types of interactions that was in enabling. Um, but just just reading this card, I don't see this being forbidden. It just it feels like a very good card you would play in the Dogmatic uh, deck. I guess you could play in a few other decks if uh, there were extra deck monsters you want to send to the graveyard. But it all depends on what you're dumping and what interaction that was triggering. But no, yeah, final answer, not banned. You are correct. Dogmatic right. Punishment was never banned. Definitely a very strong card, though. Uh, this never really necessarily saw play in like a Dogmatica deck. It was it was played, but it actually was more so used. It's funny you mentioned when we're talking about the way trap cards have been used throughout Yu-Gi-Oh's history. So trap cards essentially now fall into one of two categories. It's either the infinite and permanence evenly matched type cards where they can just bypass needing to be set face down whatsoever. Uh, also, I would put into that camp just the floodgates in general, just because whatever floodgates are are still remaining in the game are powerful enough that it warrants playing them, whether it is in the main board or the sideboard. And Dogmatic Punishment falls in another category where it's just a very high value trap card that 
The only other way people are playing trap cards is if there is an entire deck centralizing around trap focus support that is worth playing a card like this. So we're talking about decks like Labyrinth. We're talking about, you know, Paleo. Just decks that are trap cards, you know, inherently, or they get so many benefits from playing trap cards altogether. And I really like the design of this card because it lets you turn your extra deck into a different type of toolbox because you're looking, like you said early on, uh, to find cards to send to the graveyard to really maximize the value of punishment. So you mentioned Intis, and that's why I showed you this because I figured you know Intis, but you haven't seen this card yet. Uh, so this turns your punishment into a two for one, essentially. You get to pop two of your opponent's stuff uh, just for using this one punishment. There's also a card, uh, Garura, that when it's sent to the graveyard, you draw a card. So it's still uh, plussing you, but yeah. it's just in a different way. Instead of destroying some of your opponent's stuff, you're getting some card value. There's another card, I believe, uh, Win Pegasus Adagnister, that you could banish it from the graveyard to like bounce a card your opponent controls back to the hand. So similar type of effect as Intis, but just done in a separate way. And uh, yeah, it just allows you to have a very diverse sideboard for these trap decks that may not even care about the extra deck because they're just playing a bunch of trap cards. But now all of a sudden, the extra deck is this really powerful toolbox for uh, these decks just because punishment allows it to be as such. Yeah, it's actually something else that makes trap cards like this kind of really difficult to place is because all of the spot removal for the game moved into the extra deck because you no longer needed to draw it. So you have plenty of cards in the extra deck that just do these... Yeah, destroy a monster, destroy a spell or trap. And that kind of made trap cards yeah. even less uh, appealing. So playing this in a deck where you're not going to be summoning a bunch from the extra deck is really cool. It fits, it fits well for those decks. Yeah, don't get me wrong. This card, this card in the right deck saw tons of play. And uh, it was a really strong card for the decks that were able to take advantage of it. It wasn't like game breaking or anything, but uh, it, it did see tier one deck play, uh, which might surprise some people who you might be familiar with modern Yu-Gi-Oh! and never seen this card before. But, all right, you are two for one. We've shown you a monster, a spell, and a trap. Let's cycle it back to monster. I remember I was shown a rise heart and a field where somebody had nine zones they couldn't play in. <laughs> so I'm... I'm I... This is from the archetype, but a uh, different type of effect, though. Okay, if you control no monsters, you can special summon this card from your hand. That has always been a powerful effect. Even Cyber Dragon has his hat on for that. Uh, you can use each of the following effects of Cashier or Fenrir once per turn. During your main phase, you can add one Cashier monster from your deck to your hand. Okay, so it's just a rot themed rota. When this card declares an attack, or if an opponent activates a monster effect, you can target one face-up card your opponent controls, banish it face down. Oh, okay. What's that? Uh, there was another card that was similar that caused a bunch of problems. Is it Try Try Prankratops? Dino Rustler or Pankratops. Yeah, yes, Pankratops. Yes. This card is very similar. This card this is very card, similar. This card is better than that card, and that card was already causing problems. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Oh dear. Yeah, you just summon this and then you get to search. So your consistency is going to be super high in this deck. It's a great turn one play because it doesn't even rely on your opponent controlling a monster. You just straight up just play this. When this card declares an attack, or if your opponent activates a monster effect, uh, except you're in a damage step, you can target will face up. Yeah, it's just removal on a stick as well. That's like really obnoxious. You get the search and then you also <laughs> get like, it doesn't negate the effects, but it is interruption that starts messing with your opponent. This card's pretty brutal, actually. What are we looking at? Level seven, I guess. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven Earth. This card is ugh. this card is very, very good theme support. There's no reason why you would never play three copies of this. You, yeah, if games lasted longer, you could even add another copy of this to just set up a loop between them uh, to just make it really obnoxious. Very for perceptive. To get very perceptive. This card. This card is very strong. <laughs> yeah, and it also turns into a rise heart, which, uh, which that card seemed silly when I saw it. So yeah, I mean, you can you can evaluate this in a vacuum. Like the rise heart thing is another thing entirely. This card feels. Well, I don't, I don't know how else to say it, but this card is just ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Just 20, it's 2400 as well, so it is a real threat to anything on the table. And then it just goes on yeah. to banish stuff. And then it, if it survives, if you survive, you just add another card to your hand as well. Because that's not just once when it's summoned. So if you if yep. you fail to kill it, the game is 100% over. Ah, oh, God, that's disgusting. That's just like, yeah, if I, if I survive, if you pass back to me and this is face up, the game is over. Now, was it banned? See, this is the problem. In, in a vacuum, <laughs> I wonder if this card got limited, actually. It probably got limited okay. before it was okay. forbidden. I don't know. It would have been. It depends on what else you were doing in the archetype, because a lot of the strength is going to be what can I add to my from my deck to my hand for this. The last effect is ridiculously powerful, considering that you can just special summon it as well. I can see this maybe getting forbidden eventually if the Kishira deck had been around for a while and causing lots of problems, and it was just like the f we we need to gut this completely. I would guess this got limited. I don't think I don't think it was in. A for I don't don't think it went from three to zero. I think it may have gone three to one, maybe one to zero. I don't think it went directly from three to zero. But again, that does depend on what you can search for. Uh, so my answer would be not ev eventually forbidden. 
but not initially. So Fenrir is, as you said, just an absurd card. Some yeah. people would consider this card just broken, just just at its core. How, I mean, you know this, especially from playing older Yu-Gi-Oh and working, you know, for your time that you worked. Uh, it's very rare to see a card that is able to search itself, let alone one that is so powerful that can yeah. search itself on top of it. It is an immediate plus one when you play it. If you lead with this as part of your first turn, now all of a sudden, if your opponent hand traps you at all, you can trigger this Fenrir to then like banish something that they have. So if they do have a way to put anything on the board, because there are monsters that can special summon themselves out during your opponent's turn on their hypothetical turn zero, Fenrir can then immediately dispatch of those. And now they don't have those tools to use during their turn. As you said, if Fenrir sticks around, it's just a nightmare to deal with. This card, similar to Pankratops, can just solo boards just by yeah. itself. It's great going first because then you can also use it as a material to do something. But as you play it, it's just an immediate plus one. And even if you get rid of it and decide not to keep it on the field, it did its job. It replaced itself. And that's sometimes just good enough. And if you took away something out of your opponent's field, that's just a bonus at that point. But then going second, your opponent sets up a board. The last thing you want to see your opponent do is go special summon Fenrir. And then you're like, great. This card is probably going to take out at least one of my cards just because of the fact that most types of effects that are being activated, because remember, trap cards aren't that good anymore, yeah. are probably monster effects. And so if that effect doesn't immediately deal with Fenrir, it might bait one, if not two cards, because the first thing might be used to dispatch of the Fenrir. The Fenrir can like activate and then like they have to use something to negate the Fenrir. Uh, it, just an incredibly, incredibly pushed card in my eyes. I agree. And was not banned in the TCG. I think this is banned in the OCG, funny enough, as well. But this card is still legal at three copies in the TCG. And the debate between this and Pankratops is interesting. Pankratops has a lot of its own upsides just because since it like tributes itself to pop cards, it's a lot harder to like interact with. But Fenrir sticking around is way more resilient and just makes the game end a lot quicker. Uh, Pankratops is like slightly bigger, but I think most people would agree Fenrir is probably the better card. Uh, it's just mm. like power crap Pankratops at that point. Yeah, for sure. I am surprised that this is still allowed at three copies. That seems That's... insane. <laughs> you're not the only one. <laughs> is, is this card still part of like a tier one deck right now? That you're Right you're now? With? This may shock you. No. What has happened? What? <laughs> what has happened to that? This card is... Well, there's, there's a deck called... There, let's just say Fenrir is not fire. So uh, there is no... Uh, <laughs> there's no snake eye name on Fenrir. Maybe then it would be playable at the current moment. But yes, Yu-Gi-Oh! has definitely gone off the rails quite a bit. If a card this powerful yeah. is currently not seeing play. I'd, it's uh, it's crazy. I would have it's crazy. been tempted to just build my entire deck around, around this. <laughs> Essentially, because it's like, oh yeah, the longer it sticks on the board... It keeps, I just keep getting more and more resources and I'm killing something on the attack and I'm banishing stuff. I can even trigger this on the attack if you don't activate anything. Yep. Some people would play like even like trap decks could just side deck Fenrir or even play it just because it's another interruption, yeah, you right? It's just a really solid card that you could just play Fenrir control and sometimes your opponent can't out it and it just takes over the game by itself. You could you could just put if you can play free copies, you could just put free copies of this in any deck because it's like, okay, cool, I swing over your board and I also add the next one. So I've got That's what people would do. Yeah, you just put free free friend or in anything. Yeah. Yeah, they would either use it as a main deck card just because, like I said, they could use it for uh, interacting with the opponent or just use it as material after they search another copy of itself. They could link it off or do something with it that way. Or going second, they would bring it in out of the sideboard and they would just use it as a way to break boards. Just it, just a phenomenal card all around. There's like there's hardly a downside to this card, which is crazy. <laughs> yeah, this uh, this card is this card is great. Um, I I really like this. Um, seems overtuned, but I can understand why it got forbidden. I'm surprised. I would have thought it had gone to one and then eventually gotten forbidden, but it's still at three. So something is awry in the world of Yu-Gi-Oh at the moment. So you were in product design. Yep. Where would you slot this in the product? Oh God! <laughs> there are, now we're asking the real question. There are two appropriate answers for this. Um, based on how strong it is and how competitively relevant it's going to be, you could. The worst case scenario is you slot in as a secret rare. Uh, I mean, this is a core booster. This was in, right? This was like one of the regular Correct. Sets? core booster set. Okay. Yep. If you make this a secret rare, you basically make the competitive format miserable for a lot of players for a while because you're going to be like, okay, cool, <laughs> we need three copies of this, and it's going to be like a hundred bucks plus as a secret if, okay. if you slot it you could slot okay. it in as an ultra i think this would be but the problem that card effect is just so strong though for an ultra rare <laughs> like if you look at strength level you could put it a secret rare but because of how warping it is it just um the secondary market vendors uh, are having a bit of a field day what do you think where would you slot it i'd probably slot it uh ultra rare 
uh, depending on what other assets okay. I had in the booster. Because again, if the rest of the pack is less desirable, and this is the most desirable card in there, um, I'm likely to bump this up. So you're going to like this. It wasn't ultra rare. Yeah. You were correct. But it was so good. This was like a $60 ultra rare. It was that high in demand. Because everyone needed yeah. three of it. Yeah. Right? So uh, it basically had the price tag of a secret rare only being an ultra, which was wild. But there were better secret rares because this was, uh, spoiler, this was the pack that uh, Tier Element came in. So uh, to no one's surprise, there were some better cards for a Tier 0 archetype that were at secret rare. But Fenrir was still mm. one of the, the most in-demand cards for this set by far. I'm going to guess that when you uh, went through the list of secret rares, you're like, every single one of these are better than Fenrir. That tells you a lot about that set. That set must have done really well. It it was it was a very good set. Darkwing mm. Blast was a very successful set. I would I would guess. Obviously, I don't have the data to back that up, but based off the contents of the set, it was a set that a lot of people were looking forward to. All right, mm. next card. Let's keep with the train of fun cards. Triple talent talents. Uh, ta triple tactic talent. Uh, I know this card because I played a little bit of Master Duel. So it's basically if you get hand trapped you could just activate it uh, to draw two cards you can forceful sentry or you can take control of a monster your opponent controls uh this card is great especially in a world where people are stacking their deck up with so many hand traps it just gives you more gas you get negated you just pick up uh you replace the card that you lost in the negation and you replace this card uh seems very strong or if you want to go extra punishing you could just play that forceful sentry to know if you can just win the game right there and then uh there's a lot of flexibility in this and even just a draw two card effect is is great People love drawing cards. Yeah, yeah, draw draw two cards. Literally almost any card that's ever been written on has been good. Except <laughs> except for Cup of Ace or Guardian Treasure. Yeah, the Exodia players might argue with you on that one. Oh, I mean, yeah, if they play Cup of Ace, it's still... <laughs> it, it, no, it's just Not like... Guarded Treasure. No, no, no. Oh, yeah, an Exodia player playing Guarded Treasure. That that person just decided to have... Maybe it's Exodia Necros. Exodia Necros. They're just going for that weekend for fun. They're not trying to win. And that's yeah. fine. That's fine. <laughs> This card's insane, and I can see it's a secret rare by the um, foiling texture on the artwork. I can imagine that you just have three of this in your collection, and you just hold on to it forever. But was it banned? I don't see why this would be banned, to be honest. it's Because it depends on your opponent uh, doing something, so you don't ever have like full control over it. And it's not, it, it can be oppressive if people were using the Forceful Sentry effect, but I imagine most people are just going, I'll take the draw too. Uh, because you've lost a part of your combo, and you're like, I need more gas. I bet this is still at free, and it's a very desirable free off, and every time they reprint it, everybody's happy. Well, you are right on the money. That is correct. Uh, just, I, I don't even have much to say. Like you're, you just, you said everything I needed to. It's a fantastic card. Goes in and out of formats. Uh, it may surprise you that this isn't always played as a three of in every format, but it is a bit contextual to, I guess, what the best decks are doing at any given moment. Um, I, I think just sometimes the way the games shape up, this card isn't particularly good, and there are better uh, board breaking cards, for instance, that you could be playing over this. The, there is a limiting factor, the fact that it can only be used once per turn as well. Sometimes you don't want to draw duplicates of it, so you might, you know, spice this in uh, with other cards that might have similar board-breaking effects. Yeah. Uh, you know, Dark Ruler No More and such, things like that. And that's totally fine. But still a fantastic card. I remember when they first announced this card, everyone lost their minds just because they put Pot of Greed, Change of Heart, and Forceful Sentry <laughs> on a single card. And everyone thought Yu-Gi-Oh was over. You know, the Doomsayers were like, it's done. This card's printed. They're cashing in. It's over. And uh, Yu-Gi-Oh was just fine. This was a very expensive card, though. This is a very expensive card. It's been reprinted a lot. Uh, still holds a pretty decent price tag. But for the most part, it's... Uh, it, this card's crazy. This card is so crazy. <laughs> I, if I had to take a stab at the cost, were you looking like $70? Uh, not anymore. I believe it was reprinted in Magnificent Mavens at a few rarities, and I think also in the Rarity Collection. I think it also had several reprints in there as well. So it actually has quite a few printings now. This card is four-ish years old now, I want to say. Four, maybe three. Three-ish years. So it initially, this card was quite expensive. It was definitely 100 plus just when there was only like one way to acquire it. Uh, I don't know what the, the the originals go for now, but the Starlights at one point, uh, during tier element format, this card was actually very popular as well. The Starlights were pushing $900. It was ridiculous. <laughs> that's, more than, that's more than some prize cards. Oh my days. That's amazing. Yeah, great All card. All right, next card. Oh, the artwork on this is beautiful. This card is beautiful. Chaos yeah. Ruler, the Chaotic Magical Dragon. It looks like Bahamut from Final Fantasy, if anyone's played it that. It does, yeah. it does. Let's see, what have we got there? Level 8 Synchro. Is that 8? Yes. Uh, tuner, 1 on Tuner. If this card is Synchro Summon, you can activate the top 5 cards to your deck. And if you do, add one excavated Light or Dark Monster to your hand. You can also send the remaining cards to the dump 4 cards. Add 1. Okay. 
You can banish one light, one dark monster from your hand and or graveyard, except for this card. Dispatch some of this card from your graveyard, but banish it when it leaves the field. <laughs> this card is great. Like, Patrick Holman was all about Sil <laughs> Sylvans back in the 2014 format, Triple Soul Charge format, and that was all about excavation. Yep. And this is just like, yep. hey, you don't have to play Sylvans, but you can get this uh, Excavate 5. Ah, oh, so many light and dark monsters have good, great effects when sent to the graveyard as well. Definitely a throwback to the Chaos Era as well, for everyone who loves that. Oh, yeah, of course. You can go ahead, just fish out your Black Luster Soldier, then summon your Black Luster Soldier, and then you've got potentially 9k's worth of attack points on the double attack. Uh, I imagine there's better things you could be doing than Black Luster Soldier, but uh, that card's still insane. This is a really good card. It's last effect as well, where you can get it back makes it super interesting because then you could overlay it for rank eights and then detach it then get it back and do more stuff with it plus you mm. set up your graveyard pretty high um you can use it also as additional synchro material for cards that require this is a really cool card um did it get uh i know there was like dark light swarm was this like a big part of the light swarm deck or did this just not get played in in that light swarm deck I guess the dark ones weren't as uh, popular. Oh, I'll reveal that. I'll reveal oh, oh, that sure. after you decide if it got banned or not. Excavate five is a lot, right? Um, it's not painful choice. Search your deck for five cards and then. <laughs> which, <laughs> Thankfully. <laughs> my, my favorite thing about painful choice is where you show your opponent five different ways that they're going to lose on the next on that turn. Like you just say, "I can kill you in any way. Choose choose your poison." Uh, that was Such the a best fitting way. card name. Best way to play painful choice. I don't think this is forbidden. This seems like a great card to be having in mind all the time when you've got any kind of synchro deck and if you're in light and dark this is probably or any kind of chaos style deck this is 100 percent included i don't i don't think this is bad i think this is just like a really cool well, really great card that the bit i'm tripping up on is dumping four cards from your deck mm -hmm. to the graveyard and then choosing your best card from those five i'd say this isn't banned you don't sound confident. You don't sound confident. Uh, it's it's hard not to because Foolish Burial is a very strong card. <laughs> and this is this is effectively doing four of that, but it's not the exact card that you chose for. And I'm not sure how confident I am, but I say this this isn't banned. This is but this is a great card. First one he's gotten wrong in a minute, but this card is in fact banned. Mm. This is a card that a lot of people love just because uh, as the person who gets to play with this card, it's very fun. I yeah. think just excavating in general is a fun mechanic, but compared to, you mentioned Patrick Hopin and Sylvans, compared to Sylvans, the excavated cards in Sylvans don't go to the graveyard. So the fact that Chaos Ruler, like you said, mills the other four cards is absurd because the fact that compared to something like, let's say Needlebug's Nest, right? Needlebug's Nest is milling five, yeah. but that's all it does. You get all the value from Chaos Ruler being a 3,000 body, the fact that it can bring itself back, the fact, like you mentioned, you could use it for Xyz plays and, like, detach it so it gets even extra value. The fact, too, that it also banishes lights and darks to bring itself back can also trigger stuff that gets to effect when it's banished. So, for instance, you know, Thunder Dragon type effects oh, yeah. or uh, Necro Shinobi, which is a card that, like, brings itself back when it gets banished. So, it also is just, like, a further extender in and of itself, like on top of just being like the centralizing part of your deck, a lot of just light and dark focused decks uh, took advantage of this card quite well. Dragon decks loved it because of course it's a dragon. So dragon decks, uh, you know, such mm -hmm. as Dragon Link and such just love this card to pieces. Being a Synchro 8 was super easy for a lot of different decks to summon. Yep. Uh, just a phenomenal card for all the reasons that you and I have both mentioned. And uh, eventually it just got to be too much and the card is banned. I think it's sad. I think a lot of people love Chaos Ruler, but I also get it. I think it just does too much for one individual card especially the milling five by modern standards there's too much graveyard interaction yeah. or effects rather that this card just enables way too much that it kind of just ends the game once it hits the field it, it that, uh, that's the bit that was re i was really hanging on is like milling five is yeah a strong but from the rest of the effect i was like this is just good but the mill five but uh yeah no, i was wrong on that but i can see this being just Absolutely not. This is this is a really really cool card. Yeah, the artwork's beautiful. Also, with the uh, adding the card off of the excavation, if you are in a position that you want to add an extender, you can do that. But if you want to be more defensive, plenty of hand traps are light or dark as well. So you know you mm. get that like effect veiler to your hand or something like that too. So just the the just variety of cards that this card effectively searches, but then yeah. mills on top of it. Just so much value for one individual card. But it, this is a tricky one. I think, like you said, it could go either way as to whether or not this is banned. And uh, I think a lot of people want this card back but i think it's a little bit too good if i had to guess uh in modern Yu-Gi-Oh, i can only only imagine because everybody talks about how fast the games are and just <laughs> dumping five cards is probably much more powerful now than it was back when this came out uh really really great card all right only a few cards left let's go ahead and show you your next one 
Pot of Prosperity. I have seen this card before. This is the... Yeah, look at the top uh, X cards. Basically, Scry X, if anybody's played Magic the Gathering before. Um, this got covered with Far Friend Josh, actually. I think this came up in passing conversation. I don't know if we did an actual review okay. for it. Yeah, your opponent takes half damage, and then you get to choose one of the six cards, and you get to choose what you're banishing from your extra deck face down. Um, yeah, this is this is a great card. I could imagine that this was, when it was first announced, people were going a bit mad over it. I don't know if you necessarily go ahead and put the free copies in your deck. Did you play free copies? The half damage just means you can't win. Although I say that, I don't know what people are attacking it for at this point. <laughs> that, oh, the foreshadowing laugh. The foreshadowing there. This is this is a extremely strong card, uh, especially for decks that don't require the extra deck, like we're looking a little bit at the uh, Dogmatica trap like we were talking like before. Seems like it fits right there and adds a lot of consistency. I am actually, the thing that's most annoying about this card is searching for your floodgates in decks that don't need it. So you're probably playing this with uh, the Eldritch guy or like Mr. Shiny Boots. Um, so you can just go ahead and make sure your opponent <laughs> can't play the game. Ah, oh, God, yeah, this uh, this is a really cool card. It goes in all the decks that everybody hates. No, I, I like this. Um, I don't I don't imagine that's been forbidden uh, because the cost is... The fact that you can control the cost is really powerful though the cho choosing the cards that you can actually dump out of the deck the extra deck sorry if your extra decks are as tight as other people have alluded to it feels very difficult to play where i'm gonna dump six of my extra deck cards so i can resolve one copy of this I, is it worth doing it? look at the top three isn't that just um pot of duality but that's why it's in the artwork yeah oh yeah of course yeah the, other, the little face of it. I was thinking, um, Pot of Generosity. That's the card I was thinking of. Generosity? Thinking of. Yeah, oh, take two cards and put it back into your deck. It's like, and then what? That's it! Oh, the classic Yu-Gi-Oh cards. They were, they were something. Great card, not banned, would be my guess. You are correct. I, I will say, over time, I love all the different takes we get on the pots, right? We've had Pot of Desires, which is Pot of Greed, but you banish 10. And then there's Extravagance, which you also get to draw two, but you have to banish uh, stuff from your extra deck at random. Yeah. And the Prosperity comes along, similar to Extravagance, but you actually get to control what you're banishing, and you get to pick the best card instead of drawing two. And there was a lot of debate when this card was first released as to how good it was. I think something you might have just glanced over is the last line of text that says you cannot draw cards by card effects the turn you activate this card. Ah, so okay. it was limiting in some ways for some decks if they had built-in draw power within their deck. And I think what's cool about all the different pot cards is that depending on the type of deck that you're playing, there's like a certain pot that fits in that deck. Right, And Pot of Prosperity has made its ways into plenty of decks and has been a very annoying card uh, for all the reasons that you mentioned. The biggest issue with Prosperity is that if you're going first, you're just going to pick, you know, the best card, whether it's a Floodgate or if it's, you know, a combo extender you need, that's fantastic. But if you're going second, you can fish for, you know, your evenly matched or your board breaking card. And so a lot of people thought just digging for six was just too much. Uh, so actually on the most recent ban list at the time of recording this video, this card has actually now gone to one copy, which a lot of people feel is probably where this card belongs. Mm. Uh, some people might argue it should be banned alongside some of the other pots, but I think one copy is fine. It's uh, yeah. it's not as bad as it being at three. And yeah, I think it's just a, a very, it's just a very fun card to resolve, right? Just getting to look at the top six just is a fun mechanic generally. Oh yeah, yeah. That's, it's very cool. It, it's one of those cards that re rewards skill as well, right? Where you have to really understand the position you're in uh, for what cards you're going for. And there's a lot of great ways you can use this to navigate complicated board states if you're a skill player. So it does give you that extra ceiling for you to strive for when when playing this card it's actually really interesting because i remember i was working with the company when pot of desires came out and the debate online about whether it was a terrible card was so <laughs> shocking when it's like it's draw two cards at a time when there's that effect is just kind of not in the game not really right. there's this huge debate of like but you're gonna lose all your engine cards and it was just crazy to to us in uh in konami because we're all sat there like why are you not playing this card? Because you banished 10 cards that you were probably <laughs> never going to see in the game? Sure. Um, I'll just take my That's two cards so now. Funny. Um, and it, it was sometimes we had that where we'd have like a card that we thought was really, really good in, internally. And then it took a while for the players to uh, to catch on to it. And yeah, no, uh, this this card seems really good. Uh, and I'm, yeah. I, it no, makes I, sense. Pot of Desires is funny because, and, and as to add on to that, I remember on release, I went to the sneak peek and I remember picking up my copies of Pot of Desires from people who didn't want them for like 30 bucks a piece that because everyone was still thinking it wasn't a good card. And then of course, a couple weeks later, it shoots up to a hundred plus because everyone's like, oh, it's just Pot of Greed, you right? So yeah. <laughs> you should have just gone in with a striped shirt sir, sir, and one of those like little like bandana things on around your eyes. Like that's just you literally robbed those people for thirty dollars for a pot of desires. My days. People people didn't think it was good. It, people really thought the card was just was was not 
good at all. And then uh, obviously time showed that, hey, drawing two cards in Yu-Gi-Oh was pretty good, I hear. Yeah. All right. Only a few left. Only a few left. Only a few left. Tell me what you think about this guy. Zeus. Uh, I know this card because I got to play with it a little bit in Master Duel. This card is nuts. I It's so egregiously <laughs> overpowered. Once per turn, if an XE monster battled this turn, you can also access Divine Arsenal Zeus. By using YC monsters to control this... Attach two materials from this card. Send all of the cards from the field to the graveyard. Once return of another card you control is destroyed by battle card effect. You attach one card from your hand or deck or extra decks to this card. Oh, this card is infuriating. Uh, it's a great <laughs> plan B if you don't end the game uh, on your attack. And you're just like, cool, I'm just going to sit on this. And then I'm holding a... I'm basically just holding an axe over my opponent's head whenever they try and commit anything to the field. This is just 2024's Exiton. I mean, what are you talking about? <laughs> 2024 Exiton, though. I actually... <laughs> I remember Exiton. That card fell off hard, didn't it? Um, well, they banned it, so that didn't help. Oh, yeah. Is, that, is it still banned? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Oh, may oh, no. In funny sense, <laughs> we're going to come back. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. This card, this card is uh, really, really powerful. Um, based on what you told me before of where the game's at at the moment, uh, it might be a little bit tricky to play, where it's like either you win on your first turn, well, you win on the first turn that you play. But this this card is, is great, and for as long as it's legal, you're going to want one in your collection. Um to slot into your deck. I guess as long as you're playing Exe Monsters as well. Because I played this in the number 39 Utopia deck uh, when I was playing online uh, with it. And it was really, sure. really good there. How do you feel about this from a design perspective? That this was an incentive to play Xyz focused decks when, let's say, Xyz focused decks weren't like the centerpiece of like any particular metagame? Uh, so the sad thing is that what probably ended up happening is you play maybe one of the better generic XE monsters that you then just throw this on top of. So you don't really need... Mm -hmm. I don't think this immediately made people start getting their Fire Fist cards out of their collection and going, yeah, this seems like a great <laughs> idea. Um, but th this card is just uh, extraordinarily obnoxious. And it's something that demands an answer before you even get to play any of your cards. Uh, like, you need to imprim this before you start playing stuff kind of thing. I can see, I can see the appeal for it because, like, you could only have to read it and go... This is a great card. Uh, it's very easy to get people excited about uh, this kind of effect. Um, so, in terms of in terms of getting people to go out and actually buy these copies of this card, I imagine it was very very successful. Even if XE monsters in general weren't necessarily well played, um, can I, I get to keep this card as well, just because uh, you do. It's also <laughs> not once per chain, which is oh even yeah yeah that's what that was a trick with this card right. So if your opponent does like try to negate it you just go i'll oh, just activate it again yeah as long as you have the material yeah for for material just like i'll wipe everything oh that's the worst thing right is you could just wipe everything and then still do it again if they then don't have any follow-up plays yep <laughs> oh it's not even once per turn is it yeah that was a it's just detached quick effect not even once per chain not once per turn yeah you just sweep your opponent twice if you've got four materials disgusting absolutely disgusting sign me up where do i get one so you've seen it in master duel is it banned in the tcg oh okay um see now i'm, I'm, I'm a little bit triggered about that chaos thing because i was leaning on how ridiculous the effect was <laughs> uh that this could be catching out i would um this feels very oppressive uh and not very narrow in terms of like all you just need is an exit monster that's battled and it then really does hold a... It makes it very difficult for your opponent to actually commit anything. Uh, I can see this card being forbidden because of it not being once per turn. Uh, or even once per chain. So it's like very difficult to interact with. Uh, you could kaiju it, as we talked about a little bit earlier. Dark Ruler you no could. more. Yeah, Dark Ruler no more. Uh, but it's just play the out is not popular with players. I remember people <laughs> not liking that as a as a response to any, any given card. Yeah, I guess, all right, we'll have to make a decision. I can see this being forbidden because of how open it is. It's crazy that Yu-Gi-Oh! is a game where a card like this can be printed and it is still legal in the game today. You are incorrect. <sighs> so everything you said about Zeus is true. Uh, it's funny, too, because what you said about people just playing like a utility Xyz monster just to have access to Zeus was true. People would find a Xyz monster for whatever level of deck was like predominantly in their deck yeah. that could attack the opponent either directly or attack an opponent's monster and not be destroyed by battle to then slap over ideally a downward magician first so you get the, an, the fourth yeah. material and then play Zeus on top of it then 
Um, but sometimes you would just stick down the Zeus and just only get one board wipe with it. And that's sometimes enough because it's going to send all cards to the graveyard anyway. As you probably know, sending yeah. all cards to the graveyard semantically matters compared to destroying, yeah. for instance. So that actually is relevant in a lot of instances as well. The stats on this card are crazy. We talked about Triple Tactics Talent earlier. A cool trick is you could take your opponent's Xyz monster, attack with it, and then Zeus <laughs> over it. So that way they don't get the card back. That happened yeah. quite frequently uh, with cards like Abyss Dweller and such. Mm -hmm. So that way the Dweller's no longer on the field and you got a Zeus uh, for it as well. Just a just an insane card. Again, yeah. I think anyone reading this who understands, not even just Yu-Gi-Oh, but card games in general, would see this and just think, there's no way a card like this could exist in a game. And it's it's legal in Yu-Gi-Oh. And it's it's funny because like even right at this exact moment, it doesn't see play. It just, it doesn't see play. I don't know what to say to that. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I don't know if I could go to a tournament. I'd show up there with my photon deck or something and then just get absolutely decimated. Be like, oh, this isn't, this isn't what hey, I Hey, your photon deck could play this though. You have plenty of Xyz monsters this, in that deck. This is true. I, I'm imagining more often than not that this went on top of like a Babuska. Like you go turn one, have the defense made Babuska, switch to attack. If I can't finish the game, just then level straight up into Sky Thunder. And the opponent just sits there with an angry face. Um, you could. Another uh, popular deck, Zodiac, because Zodiac plays all the different uh, Xyz monsters on top of one another. Uh, that was another way you could make like a six material Zeus very easily. So Dryden was typically the center point of that yeah. deck, but now it had like an extra boss monster where, oh, you know, popping one monster is not going to be, or popping one card rather, isn't going to be enough. Let me slap Zeus on and wipe the whole board. <laughs> yeah, have my, have my six material Zeus. Disgusting. Yeah. No. Uh, this is uh, the first royal that I pulled in Master Duel, and uh, I'm very happy for it. It's a good one. Yeah, uh, for sure. Uh, this is card to keep an eye on. It's going to be relevant in your collection for as long as they're printing Xyz monsters. Like, I can never see this card not being a viable. I find it weird that no one's playing it, but it, it's it's very, it's so close to just being. It play, all it has to do is have a uh, playable Xyz monster, and you, all, this becomes a consideration again. Uh, in a format, so hold on to these. I think really the the best decks now just are are playing pretty much all link monsters or fusion monsters uh, in a bit of a regard as well yeah. in the extra deck. There's just no room to play this because they need all of that room just to be dedicated to their engine or their specific utility cards that the deck can make. So th this card just, it, it doesn't have a home, which is sad. But I mean, at the same time, I think at any point, if there's an Xyz focused deck, uh, there's a new one not too far off in the future. Uh, I think the OCG just had it released called the Ryziel or something. It's like a rank four Xyz deck. Uh, you can bet Zeus is going to find its way in that deck for sure. All right, last couple. This one's going to be a lot of fun. And then we actually have a fun little treat for you for the last oh, one okay. here. So let us know what you think about this uh, Linear Equation Canon. During your battle phase, declare a whole number from 1 to 6. Choose one effect monster your opponent controls. Multiply the effect monster's level <laughs> times the declared number. Then add the number of cards your opponent controls. And check if the result equals the number of cards in the graveyard. If yes, send cards from the top of your deck to the graveyard up to the declared number. And if you do, shuffle cards your opponent controls your deck up to the number of cards sent to the graveyard. I have to read this more than once to understand this. Uh, <laughs> if no, you lose five points equal to the declared number times 500. You can only activate one linear equation canon per turn. I hate cards where I have to ask chat, PG, chat GPT what this card does. Um... <laughs> Do you okay. have any insight into how a card like this gets created by chance? Somebody on the R&D team is a currently a mathematician and thought this would be really funny. With the mustache and staff and everything? What people don't know uh, about Jerome is he, he actually trained to be a rocket scientist and he joined uh, Konami to work on Yu-Gi-Oh! instead. So this is the kind of card I could see him coming up with because he just gets this kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, so he's a literal rocket scientist um, decided... <laughs> Uh, I he just love Yu-Gi-Oh so much he was going to do that. Um, so you choose an effect monster your opponent controls, and their level times the number between one and six, plus their hand, oh, plus the cards that they control, and then if the number of cards matches your graveyard, okay, so you can set it up. Like you just got to make sure your graveyard matches. I would just never play this card because I don't want to figure it out <laughs> in the game. And the thing that annoys me the most about this is how much time in a match <laughs> is going to be wasted calculating it, and then the opponent arguing it. Because he just like, they're like, no, that doesn't work. Uh, and I just try to figure out what this card does. Really fun stream highlight moment, but absolute sure. pain in For the sure. neck to try and actually uh, resolve. Like, I'm still reading it now, trying to visualize it. Because <laughs> it does so much. It's so complicated. Oh. I think people are fans of cards that create games within a game, but I think this might take it to the extreme. <laughs> oh, for sure. It's like, almost you want to get out of here and go, chat GPT, my answer is six. What do I do? 
Alright, you lose the game. Okay, thanks. Funny card, I... No, this is this is an annoying, a really annoying card. Really funny though for for the for the meme lords, I guess. Did this see competitive play? I don't know. You tell me if it was banned or not first, and maybe I'll tell you. It could be really broken though, just because I don't hundred percent get. <laughs> Send cards from the top of your deck to the graveyard. So you can. What was that card? It basically just takes away your whole opponent's field. It was um, roll two dice, and the answer was always five and six. Six cents. Six cents. And the biggest thing about that is sending six cards from your deck to the graveyard was. Is this six cents with more with extra steps? That's what I'm trying to figure out maybe. right now. <laughs> is Jerome that? galaxy brain that he would come up with something like this <laughs> he really he really is uh like i, I said on i said on uh the organization stream with the with the world championships so anybody who goes to the world championships should take a copy of the glory of the king's opposite hand and when you get the microphone challenge jerome to a duel like you're literally gonna be playing against pegasus if you do that i think everybody should <laughs> that should just be normalized that you take a copy of that card there to challenge jerome at the end of the event sorry i'm stalling for time uh i'd but then the excavate five was good enough to get banned. Is this? <laughs> but you could if you. There's ways to mess with this though, right? If you change if you change the number of cards in your hand when your opponent's like trying to resolve. Wait, how you can't even do that because if I discard a card after you've activated this, you still know all the information. I can't manipulate the numbers whilst you're in the middle of resolving this card. Let me let me throw another wrench into. Your okay, thinking. please please do. Is there is there a world where this card is as complicating and annoying to resolve like last turn that they would just ban <laughs> it because it's really annoying and it wastes so much time that they don't want it in the game? That grass looks greener. Um, another example. It takes too long to mill that many cards and then verify the contents and then well count your opponent's deck, count your deck, mill the cards, verify, verify. Great in digital. A nightmare. It takes up too much of the clock in rounds. Um, I can see this getting banned simply if it was seeing widespread play and it was causing a lot of like time to be wasted uh, in the game because it was extending turns. That'd be the reason. I gotta, I gotta punch myself in the face if I get this wrong. Because the effect is good enough to be forbidden. Because um, you could effectively dump, wipe your opponent's field away and then dump a ridiculous number of cards. Which would be enough to win the game at that point, based on modern Yu-Gi-Oh. So if you successfully resolve this, you probably win the game right there and then. Um, and, and it takes a bunch of time. I'm going to say not forbidden because I need an answer and I'm dragging this segment out a little bit on this. Final answer. Yeah, I f it, it feels like just like having, like I could have like a whole board of like strings attached to everything, like my little murder board with a grown out beard, <laughs> scruffy hair going, but what does it do? What does this card actually do? Does it resolve? <laughs> and I'll drive myself mad. I'm going to say not forbidden. Would you believe me if I told you it was? Yeah, I would. I would believe it. Um, okay, I it's not. So I was just asking. I was gonna say I would believe it because of how ridiculous <laughs> this effect is. But like, it feels very memey. I, I, I don't see. It. Yeah, it's. What's funny about linear equation canon is that at, as memey as this card is, you actually foreshadowed it a bit. I didn't want to give it away. This card actually has seen competitive play, like recently, like within this past year. Uh, this card, people did the math, they made spreadsheets to figure out all the scenarios where this card actually could come up. And it turns out for the particular decks that want to play this, which I would say are probably more like the trap decks specifically, you know, like the labyrinths and stuff. But the, if the deck, if it fits the deck, this card comes up enough where it is worth it for those decks to play it if the player is good enough to identify when this card is able to be properly activated and resolved. And it is, like you said, actually a game-winning effect. If you're going to be able to figure that out, that's on the player, because I would never touch this card with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> but you know what? I think it's cool that a card this crazy can exist, developed by, you know, a, a deranged mathematician, and it's, it's actually a good card. It's just... I guess it sort of comes down to, do you want a card like this in the game where it's people have to really dive into the tank to figure out it is that good? I don't know if that's necessarily a bad thing, but you know, Yu-Gi-Oh also has this problem where a lot of like new players find it intimidating. You show them a card like this and it's like, oh, I'm out. I'm not touching this game, <laughs> you know? So it's, I feel like it's weighing the scales uh, of the pros and cons. What do you think? Yeah, a little bit. You, you don't want a card that's this complicated to resolve to be mainstream, uh, where that your players are just entering the competitive formats then have to memorize the spreadsheet of hey you need to have this scenario this many cards and stuff like that it just it's too much to ask from the players uh when they've also got to remember all of their combos and everything else that they're doing uh there is there's also mental fatigue that a lot of people don't take into consideration for tournaments where if you've been playing for 12 hours and then you're trying to resolve a linear equation canon and it's deciding you're on the bubble 
and it's deciding about whether or not you can count at that stage. I don't want to be in that position. I want to be the guy going, I summon Dark Magician and attack you directly for game. That's that's the position I want to be in around 12. <laughs> not figuring out whether this card resolves. I will say the one thing about linear equation canon that I can appreciate is that I always like to say that Yu-Gi-Oh is the card game that does things that no other card game does. This card would never exist in any other card game. And whether that is a good thing or a bad thing is up to the, the fans to decide. But I, I, I give them credit for the creativity on this one. Oh yeah, t 10 out of 10 for creativity. Like, this is, this yeah. is nuts. Ugh. All right, so you've done you've done pretty good all throughout the video. We're gonna wrap it up with uh, one card that I think is actually gonna be a lot of fun because this card actually just got announced for the Megatons for this year, okay. and I think this will be an interesting one to discuss because since it's a TCG exclusive specifically, you might be able to give us some more insight onto the design and how these types of cards you know might come to light uh, specifically from the TCG side. Okay. So why don't you go ahead and give uh, this guy a read? Somebody's been lifting. Oof, check this guy out. Uh, fear the <laughs> primal being. Okay, uh, during the main phase, quick effect. Tribute monsters whose total level equals 11 or more. Special summon this card from your hand, then if you control another monster, you can destroy one monster on the field with the highest attack your choice. If tied, then use this effect of Philia the, the primal being once per turn. Neither player can normal and or special summon. So it's a primal being, so it's Nibiru, but it caps people at four summons. Uh, tribute monsters whose total level 11 or more. So you were around when Nib and Dark Ruler and Shifter were all brought into the game. Uh, so how how does the, the TCG design team decide to like create these types of cards? I, I will be careful here with what I can and can't say. Um, but it's a collaborative effort. Uh, it's not one team wouldn't just sit there and write cards and say, there you go. Uh, like everybody, like even if it's a, card that's going to be a world premiere japan is going to be working with the team uh to do that and then the u.s team and the european team are going to be looking that over and have an input on on the designs and stuff so it's not like you just get like a one person writes it and everybody just okays it uh sort of situation there there is collaboration going on there that's cool i remember those 10 promos because uh at the world championships that year uh when we had uh dot ruler no more nibiru and dimensional shifter we uh, had the, it was the first time we had influencers at the World Championship that we invited uh, to Berlin. And we took, the, we brought them into our room and we were doing previews and we had somebody from uh, Konami Japan and they were showing off the uh, ex the next expansion, the next core set. Uh, you had me, I was showing off the, uh, the rocket deck, the structure deck, and Jerome had the free promos. It's like, oh, I'm going to show these off. And you can decide, you can figure out exactly which table all the influencers went to and was like, no, this is what I want to get. I just sat there going, oh, but we're getting Striker Dragon as an ultra rare to set after. And like, no one cares. I just saw Nibiru for the first time. Like, now, what we could have done is just given one copy of each of those cards to each of the various people to share. But um, no, we decided to put them all on one table. And of course, that was like, that's mind -blowing. amazing. Yeah. That's a great story. <laughs> oh, oh, for sure. And it's like, it was afterwards, you had a laugh and you're just like, we probably could have divided those cards up because there's nothing else I'm going to be able to say this weekend that's going to excite the players because of how ridiculously good uh, those cards are. In fact, I think they're all still seeing a lot of play from, from my understanding in the game because I think I've heard people still complaining about Nibiru and... Uh, it's Shifter more so. Yeah, Shifter's kind of at the forefront right now. I would say Nib has taken a bit of a backseat just because uh, before the banning of Appaloosa yeah. on this most recent ban list, Nib was really difficult to sort of justify at times. Still a fine card, but uh, just harder to play with Apo. I think Nib's probably going to be more viable now moving forward, just so now... Be just because now there isn't yeah. this way to stop the nib from dropping and so many combos don't try to funnel into an apo essentially and uh mm. dark ruler is sort of just uh it's there i wouldn't say it's you know seeing tons of play but it's it's still a good card that people will consider if they're going between their hand traps and their board breakers and such yeah it's yeah. it's really cool that for those three cards specifically obviously you know thea is sort of in the same line as those cards yeah. because it is a tcg uh you know world premiere in that regard it, it's cool that you know you guys can like look at the way the game is and decide, okay, what will help the game and like get people excited that these cards are going to come out. Yeah. And it's it's probably fun for you guys as well because since uh, Konami Japan just, it, it all just mainly comes from them for the most part because there's so many months ahead of us in terms of, you know, set releases and such that you guys get to have your turn and be like, okay, what can we do? I've said before, it's, it's really easy to craft competitive cards because you can look at exactly what aspect of the game you want to do. Uh, it's difficult sure. to make those cards always fun. Um, like if you just go very specifically like, all right, we're just gonna print Pot of Greed. Like 
that's a cool card. It's it's definitely going to make people want to buy packs, but it's not very exciting. <laughs> it's not like it's not going to be like something you write home about. Well, because it was in the anime, that I particular don't know. I example. Think if, I was about to say maybe <laughs> like that particular example, but that was that, that was going to like oh, I want this this whole new theme. Um, so I'm getting away from the point. So this card seems really interesting. Uh, unlike Nibiru, it's just it's tribute monsters. That's a bit cut from that text. I'm guessing it's just your monsters to, for this tribute summon. Because it destroys two things. It, tribu it, it well, tributes any number of monsters who hit 11 or higher. And then it kills whatever's left. This is still... This is really good. Um, I think the last effect is probably irrelevant. Because it probably dies before you get to the four summons. Oh, well, maybe. I don't know. It depends on what kind of theme that you're playing. Well, I imagine this card would also work like summon limit too. Whereas if your opponent already summoned four times, it yeah. counts the summons prior to it dropping. So as a result, if your opponent went, you know... One, two, three, four. Now all of a sudden they've summoned four times, and now this is on the board. Yeah. And now they just can't they can't continue their play. So it's it's interesting weighing this versus Nibiru specifically, and I think it's an interesting design for that reason. Yeah, for sure. Um, oh, of course, yeah. If you just lock them out, if it becomes like yeah, you just can't play for the rest of the turn unless you've got a removal card immediately. This is really good. I think this is definitely going to see. I don't know if you see a lot of play. I guess it depends on what kind of themes are coming out where the levels are going to hit that requirement. Because Nibiru, well, it's supposed to be I end your turn, but we've apparently gotten to a phase where you can play into Nibiru <laughs> and still keep going. Uh, Thanks, Flamberge. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this one's going to be... This is really interesting. It depends. It's going to be very format dependent. Uh, because if it's like Link heavy, where you're going summon a monster, Link summon two monsters link you're never going to hit that 11 threshold because you're just keeping your levels off the field but if there's like a big synchro deck or something that we're looking at uh all of a sudden this becomes quite obnoxious this is going to be very crippling to certain archetypes um probably do absolutely nothing to so many others so it may end up just getting relegated to the the side deck um for those specific matchups i don't know it really depends on what's being played about whether or not you can slot this in the main right now just that, yeah. that thought of if i link my stuff away i'm keeping my levels low i don't have to worry about this card and as long as i get to a negation before five i'm i could just almost pretend this card doesn't exist i can't ignore nibiru i love the design of this card yeah. just because it's any card similar to nibiru where the the opponent has to respect it because of the unknown information it just adds another card to that pool of cards like any other hand trap where it's like okay i need to consider especially if it's known that one of these types of cards is in the metagame i need to think okay i can play around nib but i play into thea or maybe i can play around thea but i play into nib right and like you said it really just sort of contextually depends on what decks are playable at any given moment yeah. And, you know, like, we can even take Snake Eye right now, right? Like, Flamberge is an 8. So that already... At, you're already putting 8 of the 11 stars on the field for this card to be live at any given moment. Diabell Star is a 7, I'm pretty sure. So, it like, people are either going to have to... You know, their decks are going to have to change in such a way that this card is respected if it becomes too prominent. Or, conversely, the combos have to be re-engineered in such a way that they can play around maybe Thea and Nibiru. Like, I mean, that's also a possibility, right? Like, I think, like you said, Nib on release was really powerful because it checked a lot of decks, but then people figured out ways, oh, we can play around Nibiru in this type of way. And so I think adding this card yeah. into the game is, is a fun little, uh, like I said, game within a game that you're trying to figure out how to play around it. And uh, any card like that, Gores is a great example, yeah. too, how it always changed combat forever. I think those are, like, net positive for the game. Now, the fact that it has summon limit built onto it, I don't know about that. That might not be necessarily healthy, but That's I guess time right. will tell because this this just got released, so we, we have no idea what the impact of this card is going to be. But uh, I think it will see play in some yeah. capacity. Oh, 100%. What about you? 100% this will see play. Uh, yeah, this card will definitely see play. Uh, and it's I think that last effect is... Especially if like you've played your four cards into it, but I guess since you're a competitive player, you just um, have to not... You're just going to have to make sure you don't play into this at all. Because you just lose the game uh, at that stage. Because it's got yeah. 3,000 attack, so that's already a lot of attack points that it's chucking on the board uh, before your opponent does any of their combos. Well, obviously this card hasn't uh, been released long enough to ever, you know, see the hands of the players so whether or not to know this is good enough. So we can't really say if it, if it was ever banned. What does Matt Bell, the Oracle, say d looking into the, the looking glass of the future? Do you think this card warrants being banned? And this is a video that people are going to come back to, you know, years from now. And he, they're going to see, oh my God, Matt Bell was right. This card is crazy. <laughs> oh, that'll be, that'll be funny. Um, the Beru... Oh, we never looked at the Nibiru. Nibiru is not banned right now, right? 
Correct. Correct. Okay. Never saw any time anywhere on the banned or limited list. Correct. Okay. Yeah, I don't. I don't think this gets banned unless like the game design direction goes towards getting lots of levels on the table, which then starts making it mm -hmm. making every new theme triggers this, which makes them largely unplayable. This won't be a problem because it is a big. It is a skill check to see if you can. When you risk break, when you risk going over the eleven threshold, and then potentially run into this card, um, and then if you do, you have to make sure you have the out for it, uh, so you can carry on summoning. Um, it it's a hard punishing card that your opponent can play around a lot easier than the beer. So I don't see this getting forbidden. Matt Bell said it here, ladies and gentlemen. If it gets banned, you can come back to the comment section. <laughs> I don't think this gets banned. If it doesn't, if it does, future me, I'm sorry. I did my best. All right, please, <laughs> please tell me I at least beat the Hearthstone player when we get to the end of this, because that would be embarrassing. Of there we go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Poor Raren. <laughs> oh. No, I don't. I don't, I don't, I don't oh, mean to take a dig. I don't mean to take a dig at anyone else. But if the Hearthstone player, oh, was, no, 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 if they no. were better at this game than I was, that would be that would be a little bit of a red face moment. That's okay. He's he, he's our he's our punching bag in this series, so it's fine. Matt, thank you so much for spending some of your time with us. I know you're incredibly busy with Robot Raiders, yeah. so we don't want to take too much of your time away from that. Any final thoughts? Yeah, no, this has been a whole lot of fun. Thank you so much for having me on. Uh, it's My brain is still hurting from the equation. <laughs> the equation card. <laughs> but I, yeah, I've really enjoyed this. And for those of you who want to check out Robot Raiders, if you head over to robotraiders.com, you can sign up to the mailing list and we'll send you in an email a uh, print-to-play demo. So you can go ahead and print that out. Give it a try. Uh, you can also play it on Tabletop Simulator so you can get a feel of what you think the game is. Uh, we also have a Discord channel. You can come meet us there. I do demos every Tuesday, so you can get a personal demo directly from me. Uh, we sometimes talk about other stuff as well, so we do get quite a few people just talking about game design in general. Uh, some of the good old days stuff from Yu-Gi-Oh! as well sometimes gets talked about. So yeah, hop into the Discord, and uh, you can just message me directly and say, hey, I want a demo for your game, and I will make time to do that. And follow us on our socials, but hopefully uh, you get a chance to play Robot Raiders and give me your feedback. I'd love to hear what you think. Yeah, absolutely. I'll have all that info down in the description so you guys can check it out. Matt, thank you so much again. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, no, thank you again. Thanks for having me. So guys, that's going to wrap it up for another video. I really hope you all enjoyed. Let's go ahead and shout the patrons for all of their continued support. So shout out to Shout1317, Sim00x3, MBT Play Medolce, Moto, Cameron L. Smith, The Synchro Guy, Pony Stark, Dan the Man Hoban, Little Fade Leaf, Draconic, Dylan Rare Hunter, JW11860, Brian Dancer of Class 7, Flannel Daddy, Twinkle Muncher, literally all of the guinea pigs, Cheeks McLapperty, Stolfin Amethyst, Wonder Waffle, MBT Cancel by Community Soon, Cancel by All Committee Soon, Cancel by All Players Soon, Corvin, absolute angriest peacock of the Edison Club, Daniel Howell, and life keeps using solemn judgment on my hopes and dreams. Thank you all so much again for watching, and we will see you next time.